Uh, so today I'm gonna give an overview of 3D technology and the markets. It'll be more of a market-oriented uh, kind of presentation, but I will go over the types of, of 3D. Now, you know, why do you need 3D? Well, the simple answer is the world is 3D. And when we try to map a 3D world onto a 2D image, we get some really, you know, strange things like this, right? So a computer looking at this would say, okay, it's two guys with a one meter Eiffel Tower. Of course, the Eiffel Tower is very far away and the guys are close up. And more and more sensors are never viewed by human beings. They're viewed by machines. And you have to give machines all the data possible to interpret the image. So uh, robotics, autonomous cars are all driving the need for 3D imaging. Uh, for human viewed, um, again, 3D imaging improves the 2D experience. And also, um, as we're seeing there, it's augmented reality. It, it's, it's fake pictures with the real world. You need 3D. And so if we look at 3D penetration in general. Now, 3D's been around in uh, machine vision and factories for, for quite some time. But it wasn't really until the launch of the Kinect in 2010, which really kind of you know, made everyone start thinking, like, hey, how can I get 3D into my, my product? And we started seeing, um, you know, it took a few years, but really automotive interior was the first one to really seriously put something out there with the BMW 700 series, it's now in the 500 series, and more and more gesture control using 3D and automotive is, is fanning out over the next couple of years. During this time, uh, Enterprise AR uh, really seriously adopted AR, and I will, uh, I'm sorry, 3D, and I'll go uh, more detail into that. Drones are using it, personal robotics. We'll see you know, more 3D uh, use in virtual reality. Retail analytics is already rolling out with 3D sensors. Um, and then um, the bi other big movement, of course, is in mobile. The iPhone 10 launched last year using a, a 3D selfie. And now we're going to see more and more 3D selfies launch in the next six to nine months. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. We'll have rear-facing. Uh, 3D coming out, the time frame on that is, is shifting a bit, uh, but the development is, is ongoing. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, consumer mobile reality. Okay, so, so real quick over the types of 3D technologies. Um, there's kind of three basic times, and I'll, I'll dig down a little more into each of these. The first one, stereoscopic, that's how we see the world. We basically have uh, two 2D imagers, and we have what's called a baseline. And this baseline basically determines how far you're seeing. And this becomes very important as you're designing a 3D system. If you're using stereo, that baseline may become a problem. Um, the same thing here, structured light. So this is the original Connect. And what it does, it has an illuminator that puts out infrared series of dots you can't see, but a receiver that the computer can see. And you're doing triangulation. And again, you need a baseline. And I'll show in a moment why where this baseline can be kind of problematic. And you, also, you, you're, you're not measuring the distance, you're calculating the distance. You're doing a lot of calculations to get this, also for, for uh, stereo. Time of flight is more like radar. Basically, as, it's, as, it's, as the name implies, is you're timing the light from the start to the beginning uh, as it reflects off something. Now, if we dig a little deeper, you know, there are other ways to do 3D, radio wave, for example, uh, sound wave, and, and there are certain applications that are using these. And then uh, for our light wave, our stereo is either passive, it's just using the ambient light that's out there, doesn't work in dark, so you add a uh, illuminator, so you get active stereo. Structured light, the, the pattern could be fixed, and that's, that's what Apple did on their phone, uh, or it can be temporal, it can change, which gives you some advantages. And then time of flight, so direct is you're actually timing the light from the time it leaves to the time it comes back. Uh, these are large, complicated systems, but they're very accurate, and it's what you see on the top of these autonomous cars driving around Silicon Valley. LiDAR is kind of the technology of choice for 3D. What PMD does is what's called indirect time of flight. And what uh, indirect does is instead of taking the, uh, here we go, so what we do is we take a modulated signal. So we have a, we have a carrier wave, but we have a modulated signal. And this modu modulated signal leaves and it reflects off something that's really close, it comes back. And we do a comparison, it's like, oh, okay, uh, that's pretty close. If the, if the target's a little further away, this reflected modulated signal is shifted. And we look at that correlation there, it's like, okay, that's further out. If it's further away, this uh, modulated signal comes back even later. 
So essentially, we're doing comparison of the modulated signal from the time it leaves to the time it comes back instead of the carrier signal. Now what this does is it allows us to integrate this into a, basically a single standard CMOS chip. Uh, there's no baseline requirement for time of flight. We can put the emitter right next to the, uh, the sensor, and I'll show you examples here in just a moment. Uh, but the, the key thing also is it allows multiple modes. When you have a baseline, you lock in that baseline. You, uh, you, you calibrate the, the structured light or you calibrate the stereo. You can't change the distance that system sees after that. That's it. You get one distance. Um, with time of flight, we can basically change the modulation frequency, change the frame weight, we can change the distance. And this is why we're calling it the Swiss Army Knife. You need to go one meter, two meter, three meters, four meters, five meters. Only one sensor is needed to do that. And you really can't get that with any other 3D technology. And then um, because we're, we're measuring the, the modulated signal for 3D, but there is a carrier signal. So we're actually getting infrared uh, intensity back. So we have more data uh, to actually look at that can improve algorithms. Okay, so let's look at the, the baseline problem. So here's the uh, good old iPhone 10 with their structured light. And they have an emitter dot projector here and the uh, receiver here. They stuck a, another sensor in between. But between that emitter and sensor is 27 millimeters. And that 27 millimeters can't change. If, if you drop it and it gets out of alignment, the whole system is out of alignment. And, and it won't work. Uh, PMD's time of flight module, we introduced this at CES with our partner Infineon. Uh, essentially is, you know, it's not too much uh, smaller on the vertical, but uh, on, the, on the horizontal. Much, much, much smaller. There's no baseline requirement. If you think drop this thing, there's no problem because it's not, it doesn't need a rigid kind of baseline to work. So we think this will be a significant advantage uh, for, for time of flight over structured light. Uh, here's a, a actual death map comparison. And, you know, if I, if I removed, you know, it said guess which one was which, you, you couldn't really do it. Um, they're very comparable in terms of, of the depth points and the depth quality, uh, but the addition of, since we do have that infrared intensity, we basically get more data from the same camera. And this data can be used to augment or improve the face recognition uh, algorithms. Okay, so let's talk about the modes. So uh, this is the modes in actually one of our off-the-shelf cameras. Uh, and this gives an example where this single, um, uh, module has, you know, how far do you want to go? You know, you want to go to four meters, three meters, one and a half, one, two, zero. You want to do hand tracking, you want something 45 frames a second, you want. So basically, it's these modes which, which change basically in one cycle. Okay, you don't even sit there and fool with anything. It's, it's, it's in cycle. And uh, we have people who, for example, uh, they're running something very, very slow, waiting for an event. Uh, like a hand starts appearing. Oh, there's a hand here. I'll speed up. Okay, it could be a power savings. Um, also change distance automatically. That's, that's good for robotics. So they're looking far and they're getting something very close, they can change modes and go into short range mode. So th this is, gives a, a lot of versatility uh, for time of flight. So if we do a comparison, you know, and not one technology is gonna be the perfect one for every application. We believe time of flight is great for most applications, but what I, I really do, I talk to a customer, is I go through a series of questions for their application. What, what frame rate, distance, getting multiple distance, that kind of puts you on time of flight right there. Resolution, accuracy, size, we, we kind of go through all these kind of questions and, and drive someone towards the right solution, whether it's stereo, structured light, or time of flight. Now, start talking a little more specifically about you know, this show, which is AR, VR. And I kind of did a mapping of you know, your resolution, your depth points, and your frame rate. You know, AR, VR algorithms are kind of up here. Mostly, most people are saying, hey, I want to do uh, gesture interaction, or I want to do room scanning. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Um, there's some other stuff you could do, like background substitution, and some people are doing SLAM with the 3D sensor, which, which is possible. But this is kind of the sweet spot where most of the people we engage in um, are, are up in here. And how we kind of segment the market, there's many ways to segment a market. We, we look at virtual reality versus augmented reality, and then within virtual is console and mobile, and um, within augmented enterprise and consumer. Now, within enterprise, 3D is in production. Um, 
You go out on the floor today, there's about half a dozen or more products that have 3D sensors in production, uh, mostly for gesture control. And I'll talk about that in the next slide a little bit. Um, for console VR, those are most of the big guys. They're actively designing with 3D. Uh, and I'm talking the big consumer guys. I think there might be some niche players who, who have 3D today, but for the large guys, they're, they're starting development on that. The mobile VR, uh, at least from what we're seeing, people have tinkered with it, um, but nothing really in mass production. And then consumer, I, I have a whole section on this because I think that's a, a little bit different category. Okay, 3D enterprise headsets. Uh, it's basically here. Um, you know, a good example is the HoloLens. They use time of flight, but they use their internal time of flight. Microsoft's not going to sell you their time of flight sensor. You've got to come to P&D. So um, we have uh, a couple. Uh, Meta has, has publicly announced they're using a P&D sensor in their he headset for gesture. Uh, we have several more companies which have stuff out there which is not public, and several more which uh, are about to come out. So we'll have several uh, companies in the enterprise market using uh, PMD time of flight sensors by the end of the year. And again, the main, main use case is uh, gesture tracking and uh, interaction with the virtual world. 3D and virtual reality, it's, it's almost the same use case as augmented reality. The only difference is um, you can, you know, when you're, in your, when you're complete, completely uh, enclosed and you can't see your hands using a, a controller, it's, it's a little bit awkward. If you ever can uh, get the experience of pulling your hands into the virtual world and interacting, it's an amazing experience. And so there's a lot of activity going on here. Um, and also, it's also handy uh, to, if, you're, if you are in a VR, not to stumble or, or hit something. Uh, so as a warning sign. Okay, so the next part is, is really kind of more about the mobile market and, and how that might evolve into augmented reality. So uh, let's look at mobile 3D so far. So I talked about the iPhone 10. Um, there will be several more uh, phones introduced between now and at CES, which will have mobile 3D selfies. And they will either use structured light from someone or PMD time of flight. So this, is, this has been a very, very busy, active market for us for the selfie. Now, the selfie, again, it's, it's kind of a limited use case. It, the distance doesn't really change. Um, so it, it uses a combination of either time of flight or structured light. 3D world facing, uh, actually, um, the first phone was already announced. Actually, before the iPhone 10, there was the, the Asus Zenfone with a rear facing 3D sensor uh, using PMD. Um, what we're seeing here, and what, that was driven by the Google Tango program. And if you look at what Tango, Google had a very systematic, methodical approach to get the 3D rear-facing um, system out there. And they took a number of years and, and um, you know, partnered with, with Qualcomm, Lenovo, Asus, and actually launched. And they had a kind of chicken and egg problem. They got the hardware out there, and they really didn't have the ecosystem. They said, hey, we're we'll launch the hardware, and we're going to build, build the apps and software after. Well. Um, this December, they kind of pulled back and pulled the Tango Group into ArcCore. And what's really going on now is they, uh, both Apple and the Google ecosystem are like, hey, we're going to develop AR with the, what's on the, the camera now, which is a, a camera and um, an IMU. And then uh, we're going to move to 3D later uh, after the software ecosystem, and plus, you know, the cost and size will come down just because of Moore's Law. So, you know, if you want to know why our core and our kit will move to 3D, is you can get a pretty good augmented reality experience with what's on the phone. And if you play Pokemon Go, it's kind of a it's kind of a frustrating experience, right? I'm trying to get the monster lined up with my daughter, and it, it you know I couldn't really do it. Um, you know, 3D. If you if you take any of the AR stuff that's on the 3D Asus phone, it's a much superior experience than using the IMU. So, you know, in in PMD's opinion. What's happening is, you know, they're gonna they're gonna launch and get more apps developed here, and then add 3D depth probably by 2020 at the latest. Okay, so this is kind of where we see the market going. So we're, we're kind of here now with mobile AR. It's going to go here, and then you know here. And I think, you know, everybody thinks that uh, you know Google Glass didn't quite work out the first time. But the reason is, you know, everyone wasn't buried in their phone all the time. I mean, you go anywhere, everyone's, you know, neck has been over. 
And I think now augmented reality for phones makes sense. Uh, you're not going to have this situation anymore. And uh, the good news for us is that, you know, again, when AR takes off, it's going to be gesture control to scroll through things which will be needed on these devices. So these will be a little bit further out, but we know the big guys are, are playing with this, right? Um, Apple CEO is like, hey, you know, AR is a big thing. Uh, you have Zuckerberg, you know, you can't read this. This is the future of AR, VR. It's a pair of glasses. Uh, you can bet Google will jump back in. So the, the big guys are going to be pushing the vision of uh, instead of, you know, hunching down over your screen, you're going to be back up here with a, with a scroll bar looking at stuff. So, um, you know, again, a quick summary. Um, we think time of flight is the best advantage of all the three technologies because of the flexibility to go multiple ranges with a single sensor without being locked into a single range. Um, 3D is a, is a quickly growing market. We're crazy busy. Um, and we think that 3D will be a key enabler uh, as it moves to, to uh, mass mobile. If you want more information, uh, we're here, at the booth here uh, at 824. And then, you know, we also, uh, we work with OEMs, of course, but we have development kits that anybody can buy. Uh, we have a, uh, this one is kind of closest to what a, the selfie one would be. Uh, this one's a little more powerful, more for a, a full AR or VR experience. And these are both available off um, our distributor, which is Automation24. Okay. And I ran a little bit out of time, so <laughs> if there's any questions, you can grab me at the, at the back of the hall or in our booth. Uh, so I'm a, a believer in time of flight sensors. I have an Asus phone, and it beats the pants off of any other demo anyone can get. <laughs> And I've been taking 3D scans of famous people and famous places since the day I got this phone. It's like having a magic trick in my pocket. So uh, when you say 3D selfies and outward scanning and the rest is going to take off, from my experience, the way other people respond to the way I demo this phone, uh, I completely agree with you 100%. And, uh, yeah, it's, and it's unfortunate, I mean, that, uh, that Tango kind of retrenched. Um, I think that was partly a competitive response to Apple. Um, but if you do the, the AR, like it's, uh, the perfect one is the Pokemon Go experience, which just uses the 2D sensors and the IMU, and, can, and then you do a similar app, it's not Pokemon Go, but with the 3D, um, you can, uh, they have one where you place basically dinosaurs. You can place them, they don't move or wander around. It's, it's actually, it's, it's a huge difference. And so I, I think, you know, the hardware, you can put the hardware together now. Uh, the issue is the, the software and the operating system and e everything else. And so, you know, uh, on the on the Google side, the Android side, they got to kind of wait for for Android to say, okay, here are the hooks for 3D, and now you can launch your, your hardware. Apple, of course, is a, is a closed ecosystem, and who knows what they're, what they're going to do. There's plenty of rumors out there, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I do think for the reasons I explained, 3D will be uh, a sensor, a rear-facing sensor on the phone. It's not a matter if, but when. And a lot of that is about the software uh, ecosystem getting out there and people saying, yeah, I'll pay an extra, you know, whatever, five or ten dollars uh, for the phone. I brought up one app, uh, a Tango Constructor app, and it warned me that if I upgraded to Android 8 that it would lose 3D sensor capability. So the folks at uh, Google had promised me they weren't going to deprecate the uh, 3D uh, sensing API out of our core. And uh, apparently that's not the case. So there's no way this phone is going to get upgraded. It's worth more than $1,000 to me as a 3D sensing instrument than as a telephone. So Yeah. I, uh, again, to me, Tango lives still. <laughs> it's just uh, it, under the R core, and uh, it'll, it'll reemerge. But it'll just take Google some time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, any questions, um, um, back of the room or will be in the PMD booth? Thank you.